Hello, everybody. Hello from Orlando. Hello to all the House of God people in Yeshua, our Messiah, who most of you call by Jesus, Jesus Christ. And welcome, welcome again to the Sabbath. I've been talking about where the true ecclesia is that Messiah came to build. And today we're going to move into a slightly different direction, actually quite a bit of a different direction. He said the gates of Hades, the gates of the grave, would not prevail against it. I hope you hear the last two-part series on that. And in that two-part series, we found our Heavenly Father is often working, in fact, with people long before he even gives them his Holy Spirit. He was working with Cornelius' household in Acts 10 and giving visions and instructions to Peter and others. By the end of the chapter, they're being given God's Spirit, but obviously Abba already considered them a part of that chosen people. And he sent Peter to baptize them. We also find in Acts 18, verse 10, that Yeshua tells Paul that in Corinth, he says, I have many people here. Don't be afraid. No one's going to hurt you here. And I have many people here. Obviously, most of those have yet to be converted. And so we also learn we shouldn't presume to tell our Father or our Savior where they should be working. We shouldn't be presuming that. I think many of us do by claiming and insisting we meet only with certain ones, with certain backgrounds, and so on. Peter and the early apostles had to deal with a shocking reality that Yahweh was working now with Gentiles, not just with Israel and Judah, but Gentiles. That was unheard of, as unheard of as it would be to some of you hearing this, that Almighty God in heaven could be working with a bunch of people that you would least suspect he would be doing that with. So the bottom line also is that we that we found that if anyone has God's spirit, whether we think he should or not, <laughs> and I put it that way because so many times I've heard people over the years, and at times I've thought the thought, how could this person possibly have God's spirit? Or sometimes someone we thought had God's spirit obviously didn't. But having God's spirit or not, Paul said, I, I, I would wish that all Israel could be converted. All, all Judah, all Israel could be converted. Anyway, anyone who's been given God's Holy Spirit, whether we agreed with that or not, that person is a child of God and a part of that ecclesia, whether they attend with you or not. And I hope we're understanding that and seeing that. And so I'm going to continue in a way, but on a different tack. So as I worked on the topic about this ecclesia, it led to this topic today. One of the main things that divide believers is their doctrinal difference, doctrinal differences, their set of beliefs. Excuse me just a second. Their set of beliefs. And uh, you, uh, you can all have, you can have nothing but Protestants in a room, but there's so many de- denominations among Protestants that it won't be long before uh, they're dividing into different groups because of their beliefs that are different, even though they have some central beliefs that are the same. We can have all Seventh-day Sabbath keepers in a room, but they won't stay together long because they too have doctrinal differences. So when, when should doctrine become an issue so large that we decide we can't meet any longer with some folks because they believe so differently than you and I that we just can't possibly meet with them anymore. When does that step happen, is my question. When does that step happen? And actually, Scripture tells us when that happens, as you will see. So I'll say this. If any two believers in the world spend enough time together, I think you'll see this. Obviously, as they talk to each other, before long, they'll realize they have a lot of differences, more than they had thought before. Even a husband and wife were talking about doctrinal differences, uh, and yet they can still live together. They get along at some point, obviously, even two, even two married people, if they disagree too intensely on too many vital points, they separate. And that's what's been happening in the body of Christ. And so we have the bride of Christ 
composed largely of a lot of people who, for the most part, want nothing to do with each other, or is that really the case? Can that be so? So let's move on to the sticky, stu- sticky topic of doctrine, our set of beliefs. Doctrine, of course, uh, comes from the Greek words didache and didaskalia. Didaskalia, didaskalia is how you say it, didaskalia and didache, which refer to the act of teaching or that which is taught. It means what we believe. It means what we teach. It means what we adhere to as right and wrong and, and our set of beliefs, our faith, what we, what we, what we teach. Okay. Well, how important is right doctrine? How should we handle situations when we see doctrinal differences? When do we draw a line in the sand and say, okay, no more. I'm not going to meet with you anymore. Or when, when do we not? The Bible actually tells us. And when do we realize a certain issue is not worth separating over? So we're going to cover all of this and more. And I'm hoping that many of you will search your hearts and will grow from this message. I'll tell you, frankly, preparing it was very humbling for me. Uh, I mean that sincerely, very humbling for me, because I had to come to accept it and realize that much of what I'm going to be saying today, I need to be practicing better myself. I want you to understand that all my sermons begin with a personal study for me, not for you. And then I share it with you. But I took a lot of correction myself out of this sermon. And I'm hoping that many of you will do that as well. But have or come to that point. Having said all that, is there a scripture that says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because all my true disciples have a 100% perfect doctrine. And every one of my true disciples perfectly agree with each other all of the time, doctrinally. Show me the verse that says that. No, that's not the biggest measure of God's children, is it? But indeed, we act like it is. Do we not? We act like it is. Am I wrong? And I think one reason there's so much doctrinal difference in the, in, among groups, even within a congregation, is that we each bring baggage to the, to the party, if, you, if I can say that. We each bring something from our past, the way we were brought up, the way we were taught as children, uh, the church we went to, and now God is calling us out of that. So even in the early church, there were ex-Pharisees, Acts 15, verse 5, says there were some of the Pharisee sect. And they said, you know, every person, Gentile or otherwise, has to be circumcised first. And so that brought the council together in Acts 15, that and should they be made to keep the law of Moses was the second discussion. Other, as you'll read in the early parts uh, around verse 5 and 6 of Acts 15, other early converts were from the priestly family. Acts 6 verse 7 says that many of the priests were being called into the truth, and they often were Sadducees, and they would clash with Pharisees. So now you have the Sadducees being converted, and you have Pharisees being converted, and you had people who were neither Pharisee or Sadducee being converted, and then you had Gentiles being added to the mix. And so you can see how very quickly and these Gentiles brought with them their knowledge, quote-unquote, of God. What God meant to them was a whole bunch of gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus having orgies and different things up there. <laughs> so it's discard to, it's, it's hard to discard everything all at once. And so we bring this to the party, and all of a sudden we find out it's not such a fun party. We all bring some baggage, and we're no different today. Any of us coming out of Catholicism or the numerous parts of Protestantism or Hebrew roots or Judaism or Church of God or straight out of the atheistic world, we're all bringing our own set of beliefs that we've been, our baggage, if you will. I don't mean baggage necessarily in a negative way, but even those raised as Sabbath keepers all their lives have their set of entrenched beliefs. And sometimes we are, since we realize we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, grow in it. And, and sometimes we realize, you know, hey, that's not what I've been taught in the past. And I'm seeing now that that understanding is not quite right. And so we have to change and we have to grow. And others, and so we change and others think we shouldn't change. And now we have a doctrinal disagreement going on. Right? Even among Sabbath keepers, Seventh-day Sabbath keepers, what do we see? 
We're believing so many different things now. Are all the holy days to be kept? There are Sabbath-keeping groups that will keep just the Lord's Supper, as they call it, but not the other holy days. There are some who think that, it, it, okay, we don't really, we, we know Christmas is pagan, but we will still keep it. And there are others that are saying absolutely not. And there's a big discussion about which calendar to keep. And some of you refuse to meet with anyone who says God instead of Elohim or Yahweh. Others criticize those who say Yahweh instead of God. Others sharply criticize anyone who thinks it's okay to eat out on the Sabbath. I don't eat out on the Sabbath, but how do we act with another person when, when some do and some don't? I'm hoping this message will speak to thousands of you around the world and help us to come together as members of God's body when we are members of God's body. When we do have God's spirit, we are members of God's body. If we, if someone has the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14, he is a child of God. All right, so where does right doctrine begin? Since doctrine is such a big source of the problem, where does it begin? Where does it come from? Does it come from high up theologians? I think, okay, write down your answer right now or just kind of say it out loud to the person next to you here. Where does right doctrine come from? Now, most of you probably said the Bible. I'm going to say it goes higher than that. Okay, it goes higher than that. And even if we got the right answer, we don't practice it like we really believe it. Where does the true teaching come from? Now look what Yeshua himself, Jesus Christ, What look what Yeshua himself said. John 7, verses 14 to 18. John 7, verses 14 to 18. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How did this man know letters, having never studied? And Yeshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine. Who is Yeshua? He's the Word. Who is Yeshua? He's the truth. Who is Yeshua? He's the truth, the life. He's the Word. He's everything. He's the Logos, the Word of God. And yet he said his teaching, his beliefs were not his own, but his who sent me. Now, if Yeshua himself says that even his own doctrine was not himself, and yet he was God, in, he, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1 to 3, right? And yet he said his own teaching was from his Father. And he says if someone speaks from himself, he's seeking his own glory. That's John 7, verses 14 to 18. So right doctrine comes from the head of the house, God the Father, the kingdom of God, the household of God, okay, is God the Father through Christ, who then inspires and God breathes it into the Word. Second Timothy three sixteen, all Scripture is God breathed, where it says given by inspiration of God. The Greek word there actually means God breathed. All Scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, correction, and other things. I'm focusing on the word doctrine here. So it comes from God the Father to the Word, who then puts it into the living Word, the the written Word. And that is where doctrine comes from. No other source. Mankind, churches, people, groups, have no right to change what Scripture says. For example... Uh, people, the Roman Catholic Church did not have the uh, the right to change the fourth commandment to mean the first day of the week, or one in seven, or that we're already all in his rest, and cancel one of the Ten Commandments. And so, in effect, we don't have the seventh-day Sabbath rest. It doesn't say one in seven. I heard a preacher one time talking about the Sabbath, and he reads it very plainly on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath shall be the seventh day of the week. And... Um, uh, so he says, so there you have it. So one day in seven, we are to rest. And he even said, well, his Sabbath was on Mondays because Sunday was a hard work day for him. Well, that's not what it says, said or says, period. So, but, it, but, but you know, uh, so in fact, I believe if you study Catholic doctrine, you will find that they say that they have a right, that their councils and everything even supersedes what Scripture says, that if there's a conflict between them. Now, Judaism does the same thing. They will actually give more power to the Talmud, to their Mishnah, 
okay, to their to their traditions than they will give to the actual word of God. They will actually study their Talmud more than they will study the word of God. And so they make rules and making the Sabbath a burden and not the joy that Yeshua wanted it to always be. He's the one who created the Sabbath back in Genesis 2. And so all their specific rules about how to wash hands all the way up to the elbow in a certain way and which hand first, which shoe to put on when you first, when you first get up. I'm not kidding. All this is in the Talmud. How to pray, which prayers to use, when and what days and so forth. They have that all laid out. <clears throat> None of that came from God Most High. None of that came from the Bible. Now, some are even studying Kabbalah or Kabbalah, okay? And I don't think we should be. There are some uh, Hebrew Roots teachers that I know are teaching from Kabbalah. And so uh, that's the Jewish mysticism, you know, and, and, and be, be very, very careful, very careful. People get excited. They hear something new. And if it's coming from that sort of a source, from mysticism, um, have nothing to do with it. Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9. Matthew 15, 1 to 9. Here's a story where scribes and Pharisees were around Yeshua, and they said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Not Scripture, but the tradition. And so in Judaism, you have a lot of tradition. And many of you who are getting involved in Hebrew roots and in the Messianic movement are following Hebrew tradition more than you realize in many cases, and, 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 and look, they accused our Savior of not following the tradition. For they wash, they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. They didn't wash their hands the traditional way. Okay, according to the way the elders did. I went to a Hebrew Roots meeting one time where they had the washing of the hands before dinner. And it took about an hour and a half to get everybody through there, or an hour or so. And, uh, it was slow and laborious and everything. The food was getting cold and, and I'm thinking, what is the point of all of this? Anyway, the pastor asked me afterwards what I thought of that. And I said, I wasn't going to say anything, but you did ask me. The Bible says to be ready with a reason for the hope that's within you. And I said, Yeshua was criticized for not doing the traditional washing. So I'm thinking to myself, why did you do it? And so anyway, and Yeshua answered them in Matthew 15, verse 3. Why do you, he says, you're asking me why we transgress the tradition? And he says, well, why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? God said, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother will be put to death. But you said, whoever says to his father, whatever profit you might have received from me is like actually intended for a gift for God. I don't need to honor you. Okay, don't need to honor father and mother. And so you made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. And he says, you people, in verse 9, you draw near to me, in verse 8, you draw near to me with your mouth, you honor me with your lips, your heart is far from me. You're going through all the motions of worship. You dress the right clothing, you put the right, you put the talit on right, you put the sheet seat on right, the, the tassels, or you put on your Sunday best or whatever, whatever faith you're coming from. And you go to church and you look good and you sing the right songs in the right sequence and your heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me. In vain, for nothing, do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. So there you have it. We don't have doctrines that come from commandments of man. Yeshua said that's wrong. And I've seen doctrines and teachings rise up, and I've slipped into it at times myself where we define exactly what's allowed and not allowed as dress, as hairstyles, as things we can and can't do on the Sabbath, what jobs we can hold, what in detail we must avoid in foods, whether the sundown on Sabbath is the visible sundown or is that, which is, or is that really just a refraction of the sun that's already set, and on and on. What kind of music is allowed in church or on the Sabbath or at home? Can you watch any TV on the Sabbath? Can you watch the news or not, or nature film or not? What exactly women can do or can't do in church services? Some of you think you're getting that from scriptures. Read The thing about scriptures is read all of what scripture has to say about it to form your doctrine. Read all 
the whole commandment of God. Read all scriptures on a topic and, and, and then form your doctrine based on scripture. And that's what we got to be doing. And, and some say they can talk in church services in these circumstances, but not in these. Others say women shouldn't be involved in any leadership, not even as an usher. Um, others say any time the group gets together is a church service, and it gets ridiculous. And so we miss the point of Scripture. Love one another and love God. The first and greatest is to love God with all you've got, everything. And the second one is like it, to love each other as yourself. And don't be guilty of what Yeshua teaches, that it's possible to be striving to be so careful in how we obey that we become obnoxious and a stench to everybody, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines these commandments you guys made up. Whether you need to wear a white shirt or, or, or blue shirt's wrong somehow, or if you have to wear a coat and tie in all circumstances, because even in hot, muggy Kenya or the Philippines or Florida, You've got to wear this coat and tie. I'll guarantee you Yeshua is not wearing a coat and tie right now. And others feel they need to dress like they did 2,000 years ago in Judah. Where are we getting this stuff? Where are we getting this stuff? Traditions of men. So I say again, focus on the big two. Love God, love each other, and the rest will fall into place. Now, how important is doctrine? Think of right doctrine for a moment as simply being the truth. How important is the truth? Well, truth is vital. Truth is vital, folks. Uh, You go to John 4, Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well and um, who was trying to defend a Samaritan error that Mount Gerizim was more important than Jerusalem. And their temple on Mount Gerizim, that they built there, was, was more important. And uh, Yeshua basically sidetracks that a little bit. And he says, uh, Yeshua said to her, or Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem, nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. He says, okay, you're trying to make a big case. You're trying to get me into an argument because I'm a Jew, that, that your Mount Gerizim is more important than our Jerusalem. It's not going to matter, he said. You worship what you don't know. We know what we worship for salvations of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is, from now on, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, yes, truth, doctrine is important. We must worship Father with the right doctrine. But as we worship him, let's be sure we're worshiping. Let's be sure we're looking upward and praising and blessing and then looking downward as we bow our heads and worship. Do we worship or do we just mostly spend our time learning facts, learning data, learning doctrine, if you will? God wants people to worship him with that knowledge, Put, get, worship them with his heart. Remember, in vain do you worship me. Your heart's not in it, he said in Matthew 15 that we just read. Okay, their heart's not in it. It's just a bunch of words. So those worshiping God must worship in spirit and truth. That's why I do mention from time to time simple things that are simply not true. Certain things simply not true. It's not true that Yeshua was born on the same day that the pagans all over the world claim as the birth date for their pagan deities, December 25. It's not true. That Santa flies around the world with flying reindeer. It's not true that God changed one of his ten commandments from worshiping him from his own mouth on the seventh day and with his own instructions several times in scriptures saying, don't you dare change any of my words to take away from it or add to it. He did, it's not true that he changed it to the first day of the week. You can't find a scripture that says that. There's no scriptural authority for any of that because it's not true. Therefore, we should not worship God with what we know is not true. Now, having said that, Yeshua did say that if you're a true disciple, you will abide in his word. You will teach what is true. John 8, 31, and Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, John 8, 31, 
you are my disciples indeed. That's another sign. It wasn't just a matter of loving one another. It was also, if you abide in my word, you will be my disciples. So as I go through this talk today about about doctrine, please, please understand, I am not minimizing doctrine. I'm trying to put the, the right balance on it, I hope, and, and show you it is important. Uh, we are to worship God in truth. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. It is important. But is the right set of doctrines the main thing that identifies the true church? Or was it something else? Some believers act like having all the right teachings. It's what's most important. Yeshua says, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, that you have this amazing love for each other as I have loved you. He didn't say, by this will all men know you're my true church because you have all the right doctrines. You don't find that, brethren. Anyway, warning, I, I sometimes I fear that some of us get so bogged down in the detail of doctrine, and I have, that we forget to focus on our relationship with God and with each other. And that's why the focus of Light on the Rock has always been on relationship. And I've muffed up, messed up, mucked up my relationships terribly at times. And that's why I'm trying to focus on it so much more now. As long as I have breath, I'm trying to get relationships straightened out by His grace. We're getting so stuck here on doctrine, forgetting all about having the gracious civility, the gentleness, the love for each other, especially when someone doesn't believe like we do. That doesn't mean we just ignore doctrine either. When the Samaritan woman of the well tried to say the Samaritan doctrine was the right one, and, and Mount Gerizim was the right place, we do find that Yeshua set her straight on that point to a point, but gently. So doctrine is not to be ignored, but neither is it to be pushed at the expense of graciousness and civility. He won her over. He won her over to the truth. I've got to admit, I'm having to learn this very point myself of gently discussing differences. I'm no good at it sometimes. There you heard me say it. But I'm trying to get better at it. And that's one reason I'm giving this message, because this was a study for me. And it's a study for all of us in the Church of God, that we've got to learn to discuss differences better and learn to really understand what the other person's saying before. You know, there's an old saying, seek first to, be un uh, seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Gently listen and understand where they're coming from. And then gently ask them to read certain verses in their Bible and go from there. In the past, I've been a big one for pushing my view of doctrine strongly. When the opportunity came up, I know some people who love to bring Jehovah's Witnesses into their home just to argue. Because they know or they feel they, they're going to win that argument. And they like having that argument. And there's no intention to um, really hear the other side or to even persuade them of your argument. You just want to get into a fight and show them how ignorant they are or whatever. I've heard people say that. And there are some Jehovah's Witnesses who really know their Bible well. So God may just end up humbling you. So anyway, um, when the result is strife, division, and rancor, perhaps the method or the timing of being overly pushy on our doctrine just wasn't right. Now, Paul, doctrine is important. Paul does tell us in Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16, especially verses 13 to 16, that the saints were to be equipped for the work of ministry. Not just the ministers, but the saints were to be equipped for it until, until we come to the unity of the faith, meaning it's a work in progress, and no longer tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We're to study to be able to give a strong answer done gently. First Peter 3.15, I referred to it earlier, that we are to give a reason, being able to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. But then he goes on to say, but do so in meekness and fear. Do so with meekness and fear. 
Don't stand up there and just saying, well, I don't care what you all think. This is what Scripture says. And I've said that before, acted like that before in my stupid younger days, like, you know, a year ago or six months ago or whatever. I'm just saying I, I, I've got to work on this, too, because I can be very adamant, too. But this doesn't bring people together. It doesn't win people over to your argument. This meekness is important. The more we study, the more I realize the knowledge we gain can go to our heads. And knowledge puffs up, it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge puffs up and makes us vain and proud, whereas love edifies. And so Timothy and Titus were pastors that Paul was helping train. And in 2 Timothy 2, verses 14 to 17, he says, Don't strive about words to no profit. Don't strive about words. I could give many, many more, more verses, but having right doctrine, I hope you understand what I'm saying is important, but it's how we deal with them. It's how we deal with the differences. How we handle those is what makes all the differences, Okay. As I cover other points, I want to start here. God Most High, our Father, is the source of everything we believe in and teach because he's the head of the house, period. We have to get in line with him. Just like Yeshua said, my doctrine is not my own, but that which of my Father who sent me. And frankly, a lot of you are starting to spend time with non-canonized, non-inspired books that though they may have been or have some things that they can teach, uh, can they be relied upon as scripture if they're not scripture? And those become sources of division and conflict for some. First Timothy one four, first Timothy one four, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes, rather than godly edification which is in faith. Don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Paul goes on to tell Timothy, watch out for those who are obsessed with disputes and striving over words, from which come envy, strife, striving over words. That's 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 to 5, okay? 1 Timothy 6. I think one of the big discussions about whether or not we should, uh, there's a big discussion going on where we should even use certain English words uh, or not. And so people have this big discussion going on, like, should we say amen or amen? Because amen or amen is a word from uh, Egyptian deity. Uh, and even a lot of the pharaohs had that word amen in their name, amenhotep and so on. And, uh, and yet the scripture is clear in the Hebrew language. Our Savior is the amen. So just because uh, uh, pagan religion uses that word, does it mean that we can't use it in, if it's coming from the Hebrew word? Brethren, if you go overboard and stuff like that, you'll have to quit speaking English because our English language is fraught with words that come from pagan gods. How are you going to say a single day of the week, especially if you're out there in the world working with people in the world, if you say the second day, first day, fifth day, sixth day, and they have no idea what you're talking about because you refuse to say Thor's day, or Moon's Day, or sun, Sun's Day, or, you see what I'm saying? Tuesday, Woden's Day, Saturn's Day, and so on. Every day of the week is a, is a pagan name. Most months are named after gods or Caesars, which were not considered gods. The months, March, Mars, Juno, June, you see what I'm saying? July, Jul Julius, he was considered a god, the, the Caesars were. All of the planets except Earth. Have you ever drunk a Sprite? Do you speak of your cars with pagan names? The Saturn, the Mercury? Or have you ever, have you ever uh, eaten and talked about cereal, which is from the pagan god Ceres, the goddess of, uh, the god of grain? Have you ever used the word insomnia, combination of two pagan gods' names, Somnus and somebody else? We don't even know all the words that we're using in our language that come from paganism. Anytime you say the word fortune, fortune, fortunate, narcissistic, echo, harp, titanic, titan, Hercu Her Herculean, and so many more. That's just some of the Greek sources. Now we start getting into, do you ever wear Nike shoes? Do you ever refer to a totem pole? He's top of the totem pole. Come on, folks. 
That's why we're going to have to have a a clean new language. But let's not get ridiculous about these things. Remember that even Daniel and his three friends were given very, very pagan names with the name Baal in it. Hadassah was renamed Esther. Think about it. So my point is most, and in fact, even, (laughs) in fact, even the uh, names of the uh, months of the year, once they came out of Babylon, we still have one of the months of the Hebrew calendar is Tammuz. Think about that one. So anyway, I'll confess again, I've been guilty myself of falling into these traps of striving over words, missing the main thing. And I hope this sermon gets some play out there because I think all of us have gone too far at times. Second Timothy 2, verses 23 to 26. Second Timothy 2, verses 23 to 26. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Yeah, we have to correct those in opposition, but do so in humility, if God will perhaps grant them repentance and so on. Uh, Titus 3.9, avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. They're unprofitable. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2. No, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. And we start thinking, because of all the Bible study we're doing, that we have it all right. We've got our prophecy charts all right. And we've got our doctrines all right. We've got the Hebrew root and the Greek root all right. If you, Some won't even listen to the Greek. But if anyone thinks that he knows anything, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 2, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. Wow. So I preached to myself here too. Paul, who did have much knowledge, reminds us that knowledge puffs up. You start thinking you know something, you don't know anything yet. And I think that's where a lot of the dispute comes from. We've done a lot of study on a topic, whether it's the calendar issue, whether it's a holy day issue, or whatever it is. And and I've been guilty of it myself. And we get on our high horse and start to run havoc over everybody else. And therefore we divide, and the bride, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, becomes a divided body, a divided house. So I'm getting a lot out of this myself just for me and I hope you get encouragement and admonition out of it as well I'm preaching to myself I really am as well as all of you so now think about the way you think about doctrine and truth we shall see even more verses about truth and doctrine how vital they are and so on Okay. when there's doctrinal error when there's doctrinal error what do we do how do we handle it In James chapter 5, would you turn there and read that with me? James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. I think it's the end of the chapter. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. And there it says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, he's into error, in other words, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So someone wandering from the truth, it's a good thing if someone turns him back. But remember the scriptures I've shown you that says to do so, like First Peter 3.15, with meekness and fear. I read you one where, uh, I think it was Timothy, is being told to uh, gently correct the one who, who is in, op- in opposition. Gently praying that God will maybe kindly give him repentance. So there's this way we handle it is far more important than the, than the doctrine itself. I want you to get that point. The way we handle it is more important than the doctrine itself, as you shall see. Now, back in Ephesus, there, was a, there came a great preacher named Apollos. Now, that's a good Christian name. <laughs> it's a, a pagan name, isn't it? Uh, be turning, he didn't change his name. And every time anybody referred to him, including in the Bible, they were using a pagan name. Can't get around that. Be turning to Acts 18.24, please. 
So a couple of the early converts, Aquila and Priscilla, went to hear him. But this man with a pagan name didn't understand about the Holy Spirit. So what did Aquila and Priscilla do? He, he knew all about the baptism of John, but he didn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did they quit meeting with him? How could he be the preacher and not understand this? So let's read what it says. Acts 18, 24 to 28, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now the scriptures he'd be mighty in would be what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Old Testament. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was very zealous, he was very dynamic. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside, the woman did too, and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They took him aside. They didn't just stand up in church and raise their hand and say, wait, 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 you're wrong here, you're not complete here. They took him aside privately and taught to him the way of God more accurately. And he was humble enough that though he was a great preacher, to let a man and his wife explain this to him. And when he, I'm in Acts 18, verse 27 now. And when he had desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the the, uh, disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And then later in the first verses of Acts 19, we see Paul having to rebaptize some that had been taught by Apollos apparently, but had not yet learned about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so he rebaptizes them, I think a dozen of them. So there were some differences in style, even substance, even what was taught between Paul and Apollos. Uh, Apollos was probably the more interesting speaker. I would say who, no one's going to out-death Paul. But Paul's, Paul and Apollos worked together, though they had different strengths. They had different functions. And they decried the idea that people were, were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul. They hated that. Apollos and Paul did not fall into the trap of liking that. So uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I think it is, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Both of these men decried that party spirit of I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, like you read in 1 Corinthians 1 around verse 9, 10, 11, 12. If you're not familiar with that, go back and read it. They worked together. And in fact, later on, Paul mentions to the Corinthians that I've asked Apollos to come back here and work here. But he won't, he doesn't want to do it. He don't want to get involved in that party spirit, probably. So let's look at how Yeshua himself handled that doctrinal difference. Uh, with the lady at the well in Mount Gerizim, we've been reading it earlier in John 4. Okay, he handled it gently. He ha- because we're talking now about how to handle these differences. How to handle when there is a doctrinal difference, okay? And so Yeshua, uh, in a way, almost sidestepped it. He, he does. He, he does mention that. Okay, no, uh, you know, we know what we what we worship, and then he says, but it's really not Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. It's really not going to be either from now on. If you look at it spiritually, he's saying God just wants to be worshipped in spirit and truth, no matter where you are. It won't matter whether you're on this mountain or Jerusalem or anywhere else. It's how you worship Him that's going to matter. And so, by doing that, He graciously. Uh, ended the argument about whether Jerusalem was more important or Mount Gerizim was more important. Uh, By extension, he would add today, don't box my father in, God most high, Abba. Don't box him into thinking he's only in this group or that group. Don't do that. My point is Yeshua didn't get into a long drug out fight with her. She was won over by his approach, by his mannerism, something I have to learn better. And maybe some of you do too. Let me say this too. Paul, in some cases, though not in every doctrinal case, uh, he dealt more strongly with some, some, some doctrines than he did others, which we're going to be looking at now. But he dealt 
more strongly with the people who were handling it too tough. Uh, he, he was more strong in his dealing with the way people were handling differences of doctrinal belief than the doctrinal error itself. Throughout the book of Romans, turn with me to Romans 14, for example. We read of various doctrinal disputes about the law, but they were the beloved saints, holy ones in Rome nonetheless. In Romans 1, seven, he calls them the beloved of God, called saints. The word to be is in italics. They were called saints, holy ones. Now, some in Rome were vegetarian, and they believed you shouldn't eat meat, any meat. You would think that Paul, knowing scriptures as well as he did, could have easily refuted that. But Paul didn't bother refuting that. He didn't bother taking any time correcting the false doctrine. But he did correct the method, the way people handled it, the response of those who disassociated themselves from those who wouldn't eat meat. Ponder that now. Because there's a big lesson here. Let's read how Paul addresses this doctrinal issue. He does not spend a lot of time proving it's okay to eat meat. You and I probably would have. You and I probably would have gone right back to Genesis and the clean and unclean animals on the Noah's Ark and back to Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, the list of clean and unclean animals and the fact that Abraham sacrificed a cow in Genesis, what is it, 18, I think it is. A calf when uh, he was visited by the one who became Yeshua. It simply was not that important to Paul to try to prove it. But it was important to him to get the people to quit fighting over it. So in Romans 14, verses 15 to 23, If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Romans 14, 15 to 23. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. What a statement. Don't destroy with your food a human being, someone made in the image of God, probably who has God's spirit, because you have some argument about food and whether or not you can eat French fries that are fried in this, in this particular uh, restaurant or whether you can chew chewing gum because it might have a little bit of pork something, gelatin or something in the... In the, in the, in the, come on guys, don't destroy because of your food the one for whom Christ died. Paul doesn't even address the food. Therefore don't let your good be evil spoken of for the kingdom of God is not in food and drink, is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let's pursue the things which make for peace. And it's not going to be a discussions and arguments about food, whether you should have white sugar or brown sugar, whether you should be gluten-free or not, or whether or not you, uh, you, you're going to read everything on the package very, very carefully. <clears throat> Talk about the things that make for peace and the things for which one may edify one another. Don't destroy God's work for the sake of food. Verse 20. That's verse 20. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He goes on to say that even if something is right to do doctrinally, if you can't do it in good faith, then that person would be sinning to do it. So you guys quit trying to make people eat meat if they think it's wrong to eat meat. And then in the end, he says in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, around verse 13, if I remember right, he says, if my meat, if food makes meat makes my brother to offend, I won't eat meat the rest of my life, especially around that brother. We don't separate over this kind of disagreement, Paul is saying. Things that have to do with food. 
You don't quit fellowshipping with somebody who doesn't study food labels as carefully as you do. You know, we're so proud that we're unporked, <laughs> uncrabbed. I remember meeting a gentleman, you know, and he was learning the truth about the holy days, and he wanted me to try shrimp salad, and I just said no thanks. And he caught on later on <laughs> in that, that same meal. Uh, he picked up, I didn't say it, I didn't. You know, it wasn't the timing. I didn't think that was the most important thing to talk about. We were talking about other holy days at that point. But he picked up on it. But we don't separate over this kind of disagreement. The Acts 15 conference stated clearly, for example, that Gentiles, here's another example, sometimes we grow in our understanding. Gentiles should not eat meat offered to idols, Acts 15:29. But in some circumstances, Paul began to explain that there are times that it's not that big of a deal. If you're doing it, if you understand what you're doing, it says, what's an idol in 1 Corinthians 8? Read the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 8. Maybe even pause the, the, the CD and just read the whole chapter first. It's very instructive. He says that idol is just wood or stone. So what? What's the big deal? And by that point, he's saying that he could even eat meat offered to an idol in an idol's temple, and it wouldn't be necessarily that big of a deal, but it could cause serious offense if someone saw you in there, eating in there. And so he says, you've got to be aware of that. The kingdom of God is not in food and drink. So um, I keep saying that. The kingdom of God is not in food and drink, and yet if I ask many of you Sabbath keepers, what are your main beliefs in the top five of what you would mention? You'd surely start to mention we're not supposed to eat pork or shrimp or crab or have any trace of it. And I wonder if you would put the same emphasis on the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of God's love for all of us and the, what, the, what the true gospel is and all of that. You know, we jump right to being unporked. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not food and drink. Whether you eat or not, food does not commend you to God, it says. It does not commend you to God. So the way of God is not mostly about food. The entire 13 verses of 1 Corinthians 8 is very instructive about how we can be at different levels of understanding, in fact. This is a big point when it comes to doctrine. Maybe it's true that you have come to see and understand something deeper and better and fuller and bigger than someone else who is just starting. We can be at different levels of conscience. We can be at different levels of understanding. And the stronger ones must bear with those who have not reached that level of understanding yet. There shouldn't be a fight over it when it's not something that will affect your salvation. When I say salvational issue, I mean something that will affect your salvation, whether you you're end up saved or not, end up in the kingdom of God or not. Now look at something very, very important. Turn to Revelation 1, 2, and 3. In Revelation 1, we have the description of John seeing the glorified Yeshua, the glorified Christ, shining in like a sun, bronze and fire and all that. And he's standing in the midst of his churches. They're his church, seven congregations, all seven, one church. And yet he says of several, you guys, you have this horrible doctrine of the Nicolaitans or doctrine of Balaam, which I hate. And you over here in the other church, I think it was Thyatira, you have this modern-day Jezebel of prophetess that you allow in your midst. But they were still, get this, brethren, they were still being given time and space by Yeshua to repent. And up to that point, they were still, according to Yeshua, his ecclesia, his church. Even with all that error, he was still working with them. Remember what I said the last time, that the church of God is a work in progress? Yeshua does, knows that. 
So now ponder this one. Are you going to be more righteous than Yeshua and disassociate yourself when he is still working with someone who is dealing with a prophetess like Jezebel or half the false doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Let's read that, Revelation 2.14. Revelation 2.14 to 16. Okay, Revelation 2.14 to 16. Excuse me just a second here. Here he says, I have a few things against you because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam. He's the guy who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Many tie that into an early form of Christmas keeping and all that. Repent or else I'll come and, and come to you quickly and, and we'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And so... Um, uh, he's telling them what you're doing is wrong. They do have to repent of it. They do have to change. But he began that section by saying to the church in Pergamos, to the messenger of the church in Pergamos, the angel. But it was his church. And then in Revelation 2, verses 2, 20 to 26, we have that story there about Pergamos. And, I mean, the, the Thyatira and Jezebel. And then in verse 21, And I gave her time to repent. If she doesn't, verse 22, I'll cast her on a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So he's not messing with it. He's saying some of the things you're doing are pretty bad. You've got to change. You've got to repent. You've got to obey me, he is saying. And I do teach obedience. Obedience with that... The best obedience is by faith, by faith in Yeshua, as always all things are. And he goes on to say, he who overcomes I'll, and keeps my works to the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. But my point is, even this group was still his church. I want you to really ponder that. I want you to really ponder that. Are you missing out meeting with people who are God's people? Because you're so adamant that they couldn't possibly have God's spirit and be doing and believing some of the things that they do and some of the things that they believe. That's my point, brethren. I hope you're getting it. That's Yeshua's point when he says this. I'm saying this to my church people. So the true congregation ecclesia can have some in its midst who have incomplete knowledge or even are teaching wrong things. But as they're shown the truth, they have to quit the error and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, the spirit of truth is leading us into all truth. It's a work in progress. Now, here are some areas, I think, quickly that we can agree to disagree on if people can do this without being divisive, that is. The pastor should teach the word of God, however, on all the issues below as best he sees it, understands it after praying and studying it. Uh, Maybe even fasting about it without becoming a policeman of everyone's relationship with God. The main thing is people can talk about doctrinal differences. It's how we talk. It's the intensity level. It's the volume level. It's the anger level that we have to watch. I preach to myself. The principle I try. So, you know, we often say, boy, he is so opinionated. Usually we mean someone's opinionated if they insist on their beliefs and don't come over to our beliefs. Of course, the other person's thinking we're opinionated because we haven't moved over to his. <laughs> anyway, the principle I try more and more to live by is that each person's salvation is between him and God, between him and Abba. I will accommodate each one's beliefs based on what Paul said. If meat offends, then I'll never eat meat again. At least around that person, okay? That's First Corinthians 8.13, I believe. It's okay to eat meat, but Paul would not make a big issue of it. And so he said, I'm not going to eat meat. And uh, Paul goes on to say the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. Though I'm free from all men, I have made myself a servant or a slave to all. I believe the word there is slave in the Greek. 
that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as one under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as I'm without law, not being without law towards God, but under the law towards Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became like them, kind of weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men. That's our key right there. That I might by all means save some. He says, to the weak I bashed them with my strength. No, he doesn't say that. To the Jews, I said, why are you still stuck in Judaism? No, to the Jews, what did he do? He took a Nazarite vow. He even offered a sacrifice. When he went to the temple in Jerusalem, and he attended the synagogues, I suspect very strongly that he wore seat, seat, you know, the, the tassels and all of those things when he was with the Jews. Now, how do we apply that to us today? And there are probably thousands of examples I could write down very quickly. Let's not divide over the correct calendar to use. Study it. Learn it best you can. Pray about it deeply. Some like the rabbinic calendar, the calculated calendar. Some don't like having any of those calculations or postponements in the calendar. Let each one be decided, but don't divide over it. If someone is becoming divisive over it, that's another matter. And I've gotten strong on that at times myself. But why can't we meet, and okay, let some meet on a different day than others, and, and not make a great big deal over it. Don't disfellowship someone over that. Pastors, shepherds, <laughs> What we each do on the Sabbath. Hey, that's between you and God. I'll preach it as I understand it. Maybe I'll even give a sermon on it. But I'm not going to police that over you. I don't think anyone should. Whether we say Father, Abba, Yeshua, or Jesus, Lord, Yahweh, I have my definite beliefs. I actually use all those names. I like saying Yahweh or Yeshua or Abba, Elohim. But I'll say God as well, because, you know, certainly Paul did uh, when he went to Athens and spoke Greek. I'm sure he spoke the Greek word for God, which is Theos, not Elohim. Besides, Elohim means literally gods. And for example, in, in one sentence, it says, an Elohim says, or Yahweh says, I will destroy all the Elohim of Egypt, all the gods of Egypt. So some of you who are teaching that Elohim should be used should be the word we use when we talk about God, well, that's also the word used for pagan gods, that Yahweh said he would destroy the Elohim of Egypt. I think that's in Exodus 12 and other chapters. You'll find that. Whether you feel tithing is no longer required in the new covenant, hey, that's between you and God. It's not something to divide over. I do believe in tithing. I do tithe whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater, whether make, wearing makeup or not, whether women should wear a veil in church or not. I'll tell you, you know, if you apply Paul's lesson, Paul's principle, if you go to a church service where most of the women are wearing a veil, I would say if you were a woman, wear a veil. Even though you know that your veil is your long hair, wear a veil. Don't cause offense. Wearing seat seat, the tassels or not, using prayer books or not. I prefer not to. I prefer to speak my heart rather than someone else's words. But if someone does not wear seat seat, those of you who should not, those of you who do should not castigate or look down on those at, 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 you know, at, at the one who does it differently than you. Which translation of the Bible you prefer? King James, New King James, NIV, RSV, whatever it is you like. I have my favorites. But we don't divide over that. I'll even give a sermon sometime on the strengths and weaknesses of each one. I'll do that sometime. But frankly, I quote from different ones at different times. Women's role in services, we can agree to disagree. What we wear to church services, we can agree to disagree. What I see in Scripture is when we come before God, we're required to come in clean garment. Now, there are some that say, well, we're supposed to wear white so we are the priests now, the new covenant, and the priests wore white. Well, they wore white tunics. Why don't you wear a white tunic then, a white robe when you come into services? And why do you have shoes on? Because the priests don't wear shoes. 
when they're in service. They were barefoot. And where's your turban? They had turbans on or head or headgear. You see what I'm saying? So I think what Bible what the Bible tells us when they Israel, when the Israelites came before Yahweh in Exodus 19 and 20, He gave them three days to wash and clean up and be presentable. I think we want to come before Him in clean garments, not in uh, stained t-shirts and dirty pants and dresses and so on. That shows profound disrespect for God. It makes no sense to me for people in hot and humid climates, especially. Like in Kenya or the Philippines, to wear a warm jacket. It makes no sense to me. To me, that's that's almost punishment. And I don't see God in heaven, who's a loving God, insisting on something like that. I really don't. So now, however, if I attend a service, I even ask, what's the attire? And uh, I attended one the other day, the other Sabbath, and the pastor had said most of our men wear coats and ties. So how do you think I showed up? I showed up with a coat and tie. And then I met with another lady, and her, with my wife, another lady. And uh, she's not picky about that. And I did not wear a coat and tie that day. But I was very clean shirt, very clean pants, shine shoes and everything. Are you getting the point? Now, if someone is coming, and, and this is what I call majoring in the minors. <laughs> this is minor stuff. It's not the big stuff. But people make big stuff out of it. They somehow feel more righteous because they can feel good that now they're wearing a coat and tie and sweating like crazy in the hot, muggy, sweat, sweating temperature. And that's majoring in the minors. Now, having said all that about dress, if someone comes to services in a micro skirt, especially if it's a lady, <laughs> it's a guy coming in a micro skirt, I'm going to talk to him. But anyway, showing a lot of leg and cleavage and, uh, you know, up top. I'd probably say something privately or have my wife or something say something privately if that happens more than one or two times. But realize most people aren't stupid. They look around. They see that, oh, man, everyone's got much longer skirts than I do. Most people pick up on that. And, of course, a godly woman is not going to be wanting to do anything that could purposely t uh, tempt a man unnecessarily. If she has the love of God in her heart, she won't be wearing a short miniskirt any time except maybe in her own home around her own husband or showing cleavage any time, except around her own home around her own husband. But again, that's up to her and her God. Hair length. Why do we spend time with hair length? Except the Bible does teach that it's a shame for a man to wear long hair. First Corinthians, is, I think it's chapter 11, isn't it? Could be wrong on that. I think it's 11. But, or it's, I should look it up. Anyway, it's in First Corinthians um, but scripture does not define what short and long is. And a, and a woman's supposed to have long hair. The kingdom's message is not so much about hair length, though, folks. So, so unless someone's observing a Nazarite vow, and Jesus was from Nazareth, he was not a Nazarite, because he touched dead bodies, he drank wine, that would have broken the law, that would have made him a sinner, that would have made, mean he couldn't have been our Savior. So Jesus of Nazareth was not a long-haired hippie. He was not. Having said that, in the past, we made whole doctrines about how long long hair should be. Now, I personally still will accept that God could be working with anyone at any time, even without the evidence yet of the Holy Spirit. I don't know at what stage they are with God working at them. I know that when God called Paul, he said, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? I'm goading you this way. Why do you keep resisting it? So he'd been working apparently with Paul for a while. Apologize for my voice. Don't know why I have that uh, raspiness. I'm going to have to get it checked or something. But I'll personally accept that God could be working with anyone. And my conduct, my attitude, the way I conduct myself around that person could vastly affect their whole how long it takes them to come to the people of God so I choose I don't condemn people with different beliefs in mind I do personally choose to worship with seventh day Sabbath keepers that's my belief and I believe it's a big central one however I don't decide that somehow God isn't working with someone because he's not keeping the Sabbath Maybe he's being worked on, but he just hasn't come to that point yet. 
So be kind to the Sunday keepers. Be kind to the, to the people who keep Christmas. Don't be ridiculing and all those things. God may be working with them. I choose to worship with people who do not keep. I choose to worship with those who do not keep the pagan holidays like Easter and Christmas. It's up to God to show them that. I personally choose not to support or meet with pastors who spend a lot of their time screaming about other pastors or other churches or spend a lot of time in their sermons on political issues or screaming about the president or politics or something. Why should I spend all that time going to services to hear, the, hear all that? We should be hearing the preaching of the word and preach all of it. Having said that, I want to remember not to major in the minors. Now, what are some salvational issues that you should draw the line in the sand on? The teaching of who Yeshua is is definitely a salvation issue. In 2 John, verses 7 to 11, 2 John, verses 7 to 11, Paul, uh, John there teaches that many deceivers, antichrists, have gone out. Already in his day, he was saying this. And they were the ones who were saying that Jesus had not come in the flesh. And anyone who does not remain in the teaching of Christ, about Christ or of Christ, but goes beyond it, does not have God. I'm reading Second John verse 9. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. Verse 10, Second John 10, at the end of the Bible, just before the book of Revelation. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't say welcome to him, for that one who says welcome shares in his evil works. So he's saying that the correct belief about Yeshua is a salvational issue. Don't mess with it. To me, I will fellowship and worship with people who believe that God the Father is supreme and that he is God most high and that he sent the word who had been with him forever to come as his son so his one life could pay for the sins of all humanity and that that word became the one we know, Yeshua, was also God with God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The word, Okay, it says in John 1, verse 1, it says the word was God. And then John 1, 14, he became flesh and tabernacle, dwelt among us. Maybe this is why in the, the word Elohim, translated with a capital G, God, in our English Bibles, but Elohim is a plural word throughout the Old and New, uh, and throughout the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Is God a trinity? This is a foundational concept to accept or reject. God in three persons, all equal? Is that correct? I definitely believe they're not all equal. There is a Holy Spirit. There is a Yeshua, the Son of God. And there is God the Father. But it's very clear in Scripture, in my, in my reading of it, that Yeshua himself calls God the Father his own God. I have scriptures in my notes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John 20, verse 17, after he was resurrected, he says to Mary Magdalene, I must go to my Father and your Father, to my God. This is after he's resurrected. To my God and your God. And there are verses in Ephesians that talk about the Lord, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 3, for example. The God of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, verse 8, and, uh, 8 to 9, talks about God, um, God, my God. I'm referring to a quote from Yeshua speaking, Jesus speaking. So there, the Trinity preaches that all three are three persons, or one God in three persons, or three personalities, and they're, they're all equal. They are not equal. My Father is greater than I. I'm one who sent. The one who sends is greater than the one sent. There's so many verses that show that. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, it also shows uh, that uh, Yeshua says it, that, um, or, or, or Paul says that at some point, everything will be handed over to God the Father, including Yeshua has to bow and, and come under God the Father. It says that very, very clearly. We've got to understand that. Anyway, so we separate when people cause division. That's another time to draw a line in the sand when it starts to get too angry and too, too much division. 
because of the way they're handling the doctrinal differences of opinion, I have messed it up sometimes myself. I admit that. And that's one reason I'm giving this sermon is to preach to myself and to preach that a lot of other people I know need it <laughs> as well. We, What I mean is we, we shouldn't be causing division by our differences. It's so. It's not so much the, the difference that's the problem, but the way it's handled. It's not the difference of opinion. It's not the difference of doctrine that's the big thing. It's the way it's handled. Even in the Jerusalem Council, there was dispute. It says debate, discussion, whatever. Acts 15, 7, intense discussion. Can you imagine Greeks and Romans? I mean, Greeks and uh, Jews getting together? So it says in Romans 16, verses 17 to 19, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. If they have, if they cause divisions because they're making a big fight over it, avoid them. In Titus 3, uh, uh, 10 and 11, uh, Titus was a minister, and this is a ministerial teaching that Paul is giving him. Titus 3, verse 10 and 11, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped in sinning, being self-condemned. So, yeah, we draw the line and we say, I'm not going to meet with that person anymore unless they repent and quit being so divisive when they get together. Now, of course, at the same time, remember the verse that says, if a good man will turn a, a sinner away from the error of his ways if he's wandered from the truth, he saved the soul from death. So there's a balance here somewhere. When there's the, the teaching of, of Aquila and Priscilla and the example of Paul. In other words, yes, we help people learn uh, gently where they're going astray. We also separate in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 to 13. We also separate from baptized brethren, men and women, who insist on living presently, right now, in an ongoing, intentional life of sin. And, and there you can read it. I don't know if I have time to finish reading all this, but 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 to 13, Paul had said that, I told you, hey, quit fellowshipping with people of the world. But I didn't mean, I mean, quit fellowshipping with immoral people. And he says, but I didn't mean the people of the world, or else you'd have to leave the world. He says, I meant brethren, brothers and sisters, who call themselves a brother, and yet they're an idolater and sexually immoral and all that. They're that way right now. This is not saying you should forever stay away from brethren who did some pretty bad things in the past, whether that's me, you, or anybody else. Paul says in Second Corinthians that I, I need you to get this guy whom you kicked out upon my orders, need you, he's repented, bring him back in, lest... Lest he, lest you know, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Lest he become overly discouraged and all of that. Because if you're going to say I'm not going to deal with anybody who had some pretty serious sin ever, ever, and I'm not going to eat with such a person, that is not understanding Scripture correctly at all. That is not. And with that kind of uh, attitude, you'd have to uh, reject King David. He did some pretty horrendous things. Even Abraham threw his wife under the bus, so to speak, several times. I mean, uh, it took months for the king to realize his harem was all barren. During that whole time, Sarah was there, and uh, only by God's grace did, did, did he protect her from, did God protect her from, uh, you know, having sex with, with Abimelech or Pharaoh and different ones. And so my point is, Understand what it's saying. If someone's a current sinner, yeah, we separate. I need to wrap up. All current doctrine comes from God the Father. Doctrine is important. He wants to be worshipped in truth. We do separate from people who live a lifestyle of sin intentionally, ongoing. We also separate from people who are very divisive. We remember the issue of food that Paul talked about, that you learn how to become a Jew to a Jew and you learn to give up meat if need be, and you don't make a big deal out of every doctrinal difference, and you, 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 you live together in peace and, and, and learn what's important. You know, don't separate because of food. Remember the lesson of Revelation 2 and 3. They were all still the churches of God, and uh, he gave them time and space to repent. So remember all of that. Remember the more important thing, 
than winning a doctrinal argument is learning to work with these situations with civility and grace and the love of God. With that, I end. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it will steer you away from uh, error and confusion and fights. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen.